Thanks very much for joining us here today. You're close to a year now as Chair of the Governing Authority. What's your reflection on the past year? Um, I thought I knew the University. Um, I, uh, I've always stayed close to UCC and I've served on President's Advisory Boards here over the years. And I thought I knew it, uh, but I didn't. I had no idea of the scale of it. Uh, like UCC would be in the top 10 towns in Ireland uh, you know, if it was based on population. The diversity uh, of people, cultures, surprised me. And then the whole area of research was uh, a huge, huge surprise. I knew there was research underway across our university system, but I had no idea of the depth and the scale of it and the significance of it. And uh, they're probably... They're probably the key things that, that would have surprised me. Um, in, in close to a year now, you've been obviously been engaging with other universities, you've got to know UCC um, better as well. What do you think universities and, and UCC can improve upon? Uh, they're very complex organisations. Uh, they have just been built, those organisations have been built incrementally over time. And if I go back when I was here in the 70s, there were four and a half thousand students uh, here. Uh, I, there, there are nearly that number of staff here today. So it's a very, very different organisation. But it's been built, the organisation has been built on a piecemeal basis. And when that happens, they become complex, they become over complex, they become siloed, you get duplication. Uh, and, uh, but universities, like any organisation, to thrive, they need to adapt, they need to be open to change. And that is something that I certainly would like to see. Uh, the, I can only speak for UCC, obviously, but I, you know, I assume other universities are the same. And that's something that I would like to see change and change significantly. For UCC, it's been a tough year. Obviously, there's been the deficit. And UCC has been in deficits before in its history. How does UCC ensure we're not back here again? Well, uh, it came as a surprise. Uh, and uh, the very, very serious action was taken very quickly. Uh, and a Project Alpha that everybody knows about was put in place. Now, Project Alpha had, um, you know, had cost control uh, modules to it, but it also had very positive uh, module to it from the point of view of looking at uh, income generation capacity uh, in many, many different areas. Uh, so. It's not all about uh, cost cutting and cost reduction. And one of the first things that the governing authority decided was Project Alpha would not affect the student experience. And thankfully it hasn't. Um, but uh, very, very significant progress has been made. We're three weeks away from the end of the financial year. And uh, because of the funding situation, we won't know what some of our income is until December. Uh, but, you know, taking a reasonable estimate of what that might be, the result for this year will be certainly better than last year. Uh, and what has been learned from Project Alpha is, uh, you know, cost can be controlled, cost can be contained, income can be generated. And uh, at the end of September, Project Alpha itself will be stood down as a project, but all the learnings from Project Alpha will be embedded uh, in the university systems and management procedures going forward with the intention and uh, uh, the, the obvious strategy of making sure that UCC never ends up in a situation like this again. You touched on funding there. We've had numerous reports on higher education funding in, in the Irish university sector, um, the Cassell's report and others. Um, um, what needs to be done for higher education funding in Ireland? Well. There is no point in doing another report. Uh, the figures are not my figures, or they're not the university's figures. They're the Department of Higher Education figures, the Higher Education Authority figures, and by extension, the government figures. And in 2022, Funding for the Future said the structural deficit at that point in time of the Irish university system was 307 million euro. And a commitment was made that that would be resolved. 
there has been very significant inflationary costs, payroll inflationary costs, overhead inflationary costs uh, since 2022. So the 307 million is now a significantly bigger figure than that. Uh, I'll accept that something in the region of 40 million was provided against the original 307 million, but that's been completely eroded by inflation. And the government needs once and for all to fix the problem. It's not an affordability issue, it's a funding issue. And the funding of the higher education system is not fit for purpose. So as I speak to you today, three weeks before the end of the financial year, we do not know what income the university will get from the state for this financial year. And we won't know that until, uh, until December. Equally, we're three we weeks away from the start of our new financial year, and it will be the spring of next year before we'll know what the core funding is. That is no way to run any organisation. Uh, it, is, it is just very, very poor uh, financial uh, modelling and financial planning. And what needs to happen is a multi-annual funding structure needs to be put in place. So how would that look? Uh, firstly, to go back to the affordability issue. We have a training fund which is a 1% levy on all payrolls in the state. And that generates 1 billion euro per annum, which is paid into a training fund. The, it, most of the expenditure to date from that, the, the single biggest expenditure is to fund solace around the area of apprenticeships and, and training and retraining. And that comes to about 350 million a year. But there's a surplus that's generated in that every year, which is about 500 million. Today, that surplus stands at, at 1.5 million that's sitting in that fund. And that's increasing at about 500 million a year. A portion of that should be ring-fenced to fund the higher education system and to do it on a multi-annual basis. So I would suggest a three-year revolving multi-annual fund so that universities, they're legally obliged to prepare strategic plans and all organisations need certainty. So if there was certainty around funding, that strategy would be more effectively implemented. And what I mean by a, revol a revolving uh, three-year fund is that at the end of the first three years, that the third year is in negotiated. So you're back into a constant three-year funding model. And very, very simply, this is not an affordability issue. Those funds are there. It's a funding issue. And it's a commitment to fund differently. And you touched at the start about you were surprised with the depth and the breadth of research um, here in UCC and, and obviously re the, the research, uh, Ireland's research and innovation strategy, Impact uh, 2030, places research and innovation central to solving Ireland's challenges in the economy and society and environmental challenges. But if we're paying PhD students a stipend of just under 20,000, are we really placing re research and innovation at the heart of addressing our problems? We're not. That's the simple answer. But we should be. Um, if, I, if I contrasted the, te the, the technological world that we live in today against uh, what it was when I was here on campus in the early 70s, I think it is just extraordinary, the difference. And all that's happening is that level of innovation is just accelerating and accelerating. It's changing, not by the day, not by the hour, it's changing by the second. And we have to invest in research and in innovation, and in, by extension, education. I don't see any of them as costs. I see them as investments. They're investments in our future. And we, in the 1960s, late 1960s, decided to, uh, to invest in free education, for all secondary students. That was the foundation stone for the transformation of Ireland and the Ireland we know today. 
And we have to continue to invest in research and in innovation. The 2030 strategy, which again is a government strategy, a Science Foundation Ireland strategy, um, calls for an increased level of cohort of PhD students. We will not, under any circumstances, reach those figures if we continue to pay a stipend of €19,000. An apprentice, apprentice uh, or equivalent is paid the appropriate rate, which is approximately 40000 a year. And somebody who has done a master's can probably go into the, uh, the, the workforce where we have full employment, where there are skill needs, and would earn 40 to 45,000. Do you think Ireland's at a strategic risk if, if we fail to invest in, in research and innovation? Without question. Uh, and it's time to call it out. After the financial cra crash in 2008 to 2010, there was a big post mortem into how did this happen? And why didn't anybody shout stop? And that was to do with the banking sector and the construction sector. That was the question that was asked. And the government decided that each year going forward, they would prepare a national risk assessment of societal, economic, geopolitical, and other risks. What were the principal risks that were facing us as a country? And each year, the Department of the Thieship, on behalf of the, of the government, issues the national um, risk assessment for Ireland. And there are usually 25 risks uh, that are identified. In the one that was issued last year, 2023, risk number eight was infrastructure. Risk number 10 was housing education or research and innovation was not on that risk register. We're complacent. We're complacent about the underinvestment that we're making in education and research and innovation. You mentioned Dun O'Malley in 1967 and you know that visionary change to Irish education but uh, you know students are uh, students and parents are facing significant cost of living challenges. Um, how do we make higher education more affordable? Very simply, the way I've just, just described it there, um, we, we, it's not an affordability issue, it's a funding issue. That's one side of the formula, but there are always two variables in a formula. And universities have to be better as well. And univer universities have to be far more conscious of value for money. I know when I went to college, I learned uh, that there were two different concepts when it came to money. One was value of money, and the other was value for money. I could never have come to university if I didn't have money, and that was the value of money. But when I came here, I had to turn around, in those days there were pounds, I had to turn around the same pound to ice and you know, seek out value for money. There's always value for money available in any organisation the size of a university. So universities have to be better at uh, how they go about things. And I, I, I want to illustrate one example. It's buildings. Nobody will convince me that universities sweat their buildings and utilize them the way they should be. And it needs to be counterbalanced by increasing the investment on digital infrastructure. Post-COVID, in the digital world that's changing, artificial intelligence, digital will become far more important than bricks and mortar. And universities uh, can harvest value for money by redirecting some of their cap capital budgets into digital infrastructure. 
And just to pick up on that a little bit, if you would speak to any academic across Ireland, they will tell you that staff, uh, student numbers continue to grow and grow and grow, and the, the, the staff-student ratio is out of kilter. Um, it's back to that funding again, isn't it, in relation to creating a model that gives the best student experience and, and staff experience as well, because if you speak to academics that are in the, in the lecture hall, they will tell you that numbers continue to grow and grow and grow. They do. Uh, so, so, you know, you're, they're absolutely right. So since 2008, the student population of universities in Ireland has increased by about 45%. Uh, and our staff teaching uh, student ratios are now about 23 uh, against uh, an OECD a benchmark of 17. I know there's a target, again we go back to future funding, there was a target to bring that 23 back to 21, but it's still a long way off 17. Um, you know, we say we have a world-class education system, and we do, uh, but we're doing it with one hand tied behind our back. So Sean, when you look into your crystal ball, what headwinds do you see that Ireland's higher education sector is going to have to face? The biggest challenge is artificial intelligence, uh, right across every aspect of society. Uh, the jobs of today won't exist tomorrow. Uh, and the Ireland, you know, I refer to uh, what, what GCC was like when I was here back in the 70s relative to t today. That level of acceleration, I think, will happen in the next five years. And courses will have to be redesigned. Um, I, one example, uh, electrical engineers in my day were... Uh, really their careers were with the ESB, for example, uh, or with a Siemens, you know, making heavy uh, duty electrical equipment. Um, electrical engineers of the future uh, will be in a very, very different space. Uh, they will be, you know, with quantum computing coming at us, semiconductors, uh, and they, could, they will still be called electrical engineers, but they will, they will be trained completely differently and will need to be trained completely differently. And it's the same when it, whether it's on the, on the legal side or on the accounting side. Artificial intelligence will change every aspect of our lives. And universities will have to be the driver of uh, training for life, learning for life, constant training for life. Uh, again, going back 50 years ago, uh, somebody would go back to do the odd course. Now it will be constant. Because unless each of us just reinvent ourselves every day, and universities are there to enable us to reinvent ourselves uh, as a society and as an economy, we'll go backwards. Sean, thanks very much for, for joining us today. You're very welcome.